All right. Welcome to the new and emerging special education teacher cadre. The focus of today's session is a specially designed instruction and we're going to talk more about explicit instruction. So I have uh, our team with us today and we'll introduce our team and uh, then move forward. So if you want to start over here. I'm Vonda Adams, the math consultant here at KB. I'm Chastity Craft, the literacy consultant. And I'm Cheryl Mathis, the low incidence consultant. I'm Dion Bates, Implementation and Improvement Lead. I'm Brenda Combs, I'm the Monitoring and Results Lead. I'm Doug Smith, Behavior. I'm Denny Paul May, coming to you from deep in the holler over here in Pike County, uh, due process consultant. Thanks. So uh, you'll see on the screen we've shared with you, we're going to just talk through a few slides, just getting um, a greater understanding of specially designed instruction. So we'll move to the next slide. Okay, so when we're looking at the history of the special design instruction, uh, some of us can remember that in the mid 70s, uh, <clears throat> we had what they called PL 94142. That was a public law that was written for the handicapped uh, children. Now we don't even use the word handicap. Mm -hmm. um, within that law, it talked about what we needed to have for those students to succeed. And one of those was specially designed instruction. So we must have that specially designed instruction for those kids and it must be written into their IEP and the teachers must understand how to do those uh, as well. Um, on the next screen, it actually talks about some of the uh, possibilities that we need uh, to have for specially designed instruction. And it has to be student specific. Uh, we don't do cookie cutters. Uh, it's got to be designed to meet the unique needs of the students with disabilities, and it has to be research-based. Uh, it's got to be described in the IEP, and it has to be able to uh, enable the student to meet grade level standards, and we'll talk about that after a while. Uh, it has to include alterations in content, method, and the delivery of the instruction. Now, what I want to, to talk about is uh, in the book, it's called Great Instruction, Great Achievement, and it was written by John O'Connor. And for those that do have that book, on page 24, it talks about the six descriptions of specially designed instruction uh, that, that we should uh, be going through with our students. And uh, the first one is uh, specific to the student, uh, individual student. Is designed to meet the unique needs of the student with a disability, is research based, uh, is described in the IEP, and of course we have to have the grade level standards and we have to have the delivery of instruction. Those were the things that I talked about just a minute ago, but he included that in his book. I may have said it in a different way back then, but, but it's included in his book. Then we also have what they call the IEP and lesson plan handbook. And uh, it's on the screen, so you can look at that. It's on the KDE webpage. Um, it is in the process of being revised. This one is a, a 2014 version. Um, and I won't go over the first se a section of that, uh, some of that, because it's actually talking about the, the different types of instructions. Others are gonna be doing that. But what I wanted to show and share, um, if you want to start, uh, and I'll skip the, the speech part, not that it's not important, but uh, I'll start with the academic piece, uh, pieces, and it's on page 17 of that document. And if you go throughout the document, you're gonna see that it starts with uh, basic reading, and then it continues with the reading. But on the left-hand side, it tells you the specially designed instruction. On the right-hand side, it gives us some supplementary aids and services that we can look at. So it sort of gives us uh, some examples that we can go by. Um, Again, this is a 2014 document. Some of these things uh, will be removed because we no longer do those. And then there'll be additional pieces in there. Uh, talks about reading comprehension, and then it goes into to written expression, and then it has math, those types of things. But then it also talks about, if you're looking on page 25, things about following directions, you know, uh, the speed of work. Uh, you go on through the document, it talks about attendance. It talks about all types of things that we're, we're thinking about, has, uh, our students may have some issues. Organization, we always have problems with organization. I do that myself. But uh, working independently, making decisions, social competence, all those things are in here. Um, 
to help you all look at some special design instruction pieces as well as your supplementary aids and services. Great, thanks a bunch, Brenda. So if you want to go to the Kentucky Department of Education website and you can just simply Google uh, IEP and lesson plan handbook and it'll bring you right to that link. And we will have that link in our um, Google Classroom as well as on the Holler site. So you can have access to that document. Now let's talk just, I think Chas can talk to us a little bit about that role of a special ed teacher. That is always a big question of what is expected of the special education teacher. Uh, you have um, a lot of different things going on. You have to, the compliance is a big one, but also you're responsible for the instruction. So you have to provide instruction that meets the needs of the unique learners, uh, the unique needs of those learners. You, they come to you, um, if you have 15 kids on your caseload, you're going to more than likely have 15 different scenarios, 15 different needs for those kids. So you have to look at each individual student um, by themselves and see exactly what they need and how and, and what their um, learning strategy would be that they would um, that they would come up with that they would react to. Uh, they need, so you need to analyze that. Um, after you research and you can decide which of those practices work best for those students. And, uh, and always remember that your practices needs to be research based. So they have to um, be research based in order to show that uh, to be more helpful for those students. And then, like, like we said earlier, uh, they, you had to make sure you had that compliance piece. So there's a lot of different factors going on. And um, earlier, like Brenda said, it can't be the cookie cutter. That's the big one. It needs to be individualized for those kids. So based on the work of John O'Connor, again, he's the one that Brenda referenced just a little bit, who is the author of Great Instruction, Great Achievement. He said that one of the most important things for our students with disabilities is that we increase the opportunity for the students to have practice turns and feedback, and that we deliver extra instruction explicitly. So we have to follow that explicit model, um, that we have very explicit vocabulary instruction. And a lot of times our students come to us with a a deficit in vocabulary. So our explicit vocabulary instruction is very important. We also have to think about interventions to fill, to bridge the gaps that we have. And we also want to think about metacognitive instruction. And for students with disabilities, you know, metacognitive instruction, that's really important because they have to think about their own thinking. How do they process? Uh, how are they, how are they um, understanding their learning processes? And so that's real important. And then we also have to have uh, effective behavior systems in place. So um, I think we're gonna let Dean Paul talk just a little bit about the importance of practice and feedback. Keyword being a little bit, right? Just a little bit. Um, John O'Connor's book, really the point of his uh, whole uh, piece here on special design instruction is that we, as special education teachers, ask ourselves, what is our list? What, what, what is it that we need to have ready for, for the students that we see regularly? And what, what is it that if the parent asked this question of 10 different special education teachers, what would the answer be? What special design instruction are you gonna provide for my student, my, my, my uh, per, uh, child? And, and so you have to, uh, John O'Connor just tries to get you to think about that and he provides his list and then uh, gets you to thinking about, you know, developing your own list of what special design instruction would look like. And one of the top things from that list would be explicit instruction. There's no doubt in my mind that when you're looking at um, uh, uh, special design instruction, uh, students with disabilities learn uh, when you're concise, when you're clear, when you provide uh, lots of uh, practice turns, uh, lots of opportunity for repetition, immediate feedback, and then you work uh, with a scaffolding model uh, where you would provide a ton of support for that student when they're learning that new concept. And, and then you would gradually remove, remove that to where they could actually work on their own. And so, uh, you know, when you're talking about repetition and you're talking about practice turns and feedback, uh, 
there's a lot of research that supports the fact that repetition and practice turns, if you have a lot of that going on, you're getting a lot of response in your classes in small groups that learning becomes more permanent and you can see a greater outcome for students with disabilities. And then also that you know, uh, one of the things kind of weave Anita Archer into this uh, talk here a little bit because we've all been impacted by her, her great teaching on an explicit instruction. And as we weave that in there, we think about uh, one of the sayings that came from her. We think about teach from your feet, not from your seat. So the whole time you're providing these opportunities for repetition, you're, pro you're providing these scaffolding uh, activities or these scaffold activities, and you're providing practice turns, then you're also circulating as a, as a special education teacher amongst those groups and you're getting um, a, a feel for what type of feedback they may need by, by actually watching what they're doing, looking at the responses. And response uh, can be done in a lot of different ways. And Anita Archer was a proponent of numbering your students, making some number one, some number twos, and uh, having either uh, pairs or triads, uh, you know, so one, two, one, uh, if you had a group of three, uh, and having them respond to one another either through, um, you know, some type of vocal response, it's some kind of question prompt that you've given them where they're talking to one another, or maybe they're coming up with an answer and they're putting it down on paper, or they're simply just following along on a PowerPoint that you've provided with, uh, you know, a few words left out. So the more engagement you get, the more practice you get, the more feedback you get, the more the learning becomes permanent. I think we're going to move into uh, a little bit more uh, detail on the uh, explicit instruction with Anita Archer here. And she uh, provides uh, us with a, a great framework in her, in her book, uh, Explicit Instruction. Uh, if you don't have a copy of that, you probably should get that and, and dive into that as deeply as you can. And like uh, we alluded to earlier, we do have, Chastity uh, alluded to, we do have a, uh, a charge in special education to provide, uh, uh, you know, well-written IEPs and compliant IEPs, and those are so, so important. But this is the other part of it where we're providing access to the curriculum and we're working with these students to improve their skills so that they can uh, be in, uh, educated and we can provide faith. Uh, this is certainly uh, on the top of our list at KVEC as far as what we feel like you should be doing as a special education teacher. So providing explicit instruction, one of the, one of the key points is to focus on critical content. Uh, she, she says this a lot in her trainings, um, cut the fluff and teach the stuff. Is that right, Vonda? I think that's, that's right. uh, that she would say that. So that's what's meant by, you know, focusing on critical content, uh, you know, really diving into what's really most important for our students and not giving them a bunch of minutia that they're going to have to really fight through to get the gist of the content. And so then, uh, and then doing that in a sequential order, being able to put those skills in an order where one would build on the other. So if you're uh, working on a particular subject area, you would want those uh, skills to kind of stair step and uh, they'd be able to, uh, you know, learn one thing and that lead to more learning and that lead to more learning, that type of thing. So, and then breaking down those complex skills into smaller instructional units. Certainly that would be important. Uh, as you move through the, uh, the explicit instruction piece uh, so that, you know, uh, they're, they're, they're getting ample opportunity, uh, but they're, they're, they're chunking it into smaller units so that, so it's more, um, they're more ready to learn that and it's easier to pick up and it goes a, at a little slower pace. You want to keep a good pace because she talks about having a perky pace all the time with explicit instruction, but you want also to keep in mind that, the, that uh, what the rate of the learning of the student with disability is and make sure that you're not running off and leaving them with those big complex skills. Make sure you give ample time to practice and see that they're able to move on to the next thing. Design organized and focused lessons. Uh, so you should have some real clear lesson plans uh, with clear statements and goals, um, expectations up front using clear language, uh, concise language. Uh, and then uh, you would begin your lessons with clear statements, always. And, and you would activate prior knowledge uh, before you begin your lesson. You kind of do a, a kind of a survey, if you will, maybe a pretest, if you will, to see where they are with this particular uh, piece of in uh, information that you're working with. And then you would model that. She talks a lot about, I do it, we do it, you do it. And that's kind of a mantra that she kind of developed. That's kind of her, her thing. 
and we know Anita Archer, I do it, you do it, we do it. And the way it looks in special education sometimes maybe is I do it, I do it, I do it, and then we do it, we do it, we do it, we do it, we do it. And then finally, you remove the scaffolding and allow them some opportunity to independently practice that and then give them feedback. You would use clear and concise language always with students with disabilities because there are some deficits in reading and writing and we need to make sure that they're understanding and we need to be checking all the time to see that they're getting it. I think we're gonna turn it over to Vonda and she's gonna provide you with the, the other part of the uh, explicit instruction piece. Yes, we're gonna talk about, um, first of all, the importance of providing a range of examples and non-examples for our students. All students, of course, benefit from this, but especially our students with disabilities need a wide and adequate range of examples and non-examples. Uh, also, Dean Post already talked about providing guided and supportive practice for our students. It's very important that, it, that they are led and guided and monitored, which leads into we don't know what they're thinking unless we require those frequent responses. So, when, of course, that keeps the students engaged and therefore they're not only are they learning, but they're uh, behaving and hopefully staying out of trouble as well. And then, of course, while we're requiring those frequent responses, we have to monitor them closely. And to me, that's the most important piece of explicit instruction because that's what determines our next steps when we're teaching our kids. Uh, are, we get, are we getting at them? Are we uh, getting our information across clearly to them? Are they learning? Do I need to try something different? So that's where the teacher really has to hone in to their students and their responses and they have to uh, really think about their next steps. And of course, while we're doing that, we also have to uh, give the students feedback. They need to know either it's, it's affirmative, either they're on the right track, or we give them corrective feedback. And of course, uh, Anita Archer always talks about uh, being perky and not pokey. We have to have that brisk pace in order to keep the students engaged. We have to keep the, the uh, pace brisk in our classroom. And um, the next point there is to help them organize their knowledge, uh, which is important, goes back to organizing it in a, a sequential manner. So the kids can use prior knowledge to relate it back to uh, new knowledge. And then of course we want to, it's also like Danny Potter had alluded to, that practice. It's important that it be distributed. Uh, we don't just practice for a little while, we distribute it throughout uh, the school year and then also we have a cumulative practice where we practice everything and all together to see if they truly have mastered that concept that we're working on. And then we're going to talk about um, vocabulary, the importance <laughs> of vocabulary. And of course uh, students like we've already alluded to, we have to be very explicit with them and it's important that we uh, embed strong vocabulary in their core instruction and also with their SDI. Uh, they need practice with that vocabulary, not only reading it, but they also need to be speaking. And of course they need to hear it. And then they need to use it in their writing. And then of course, um, in order to, for kids to understand a new vocabulary, they have to be able to uh, draw on prior knowledge in order to make those connections and then and embed that learning to where it becomes permanent. All right, and so our next slide talks about No Child Left Behind and how that pushed for students with disabilities to be instructed on their grade level. But at the same time, we still have students where gaps exist in their learning and within their skill level. So we still need to make sure that we provide those interventions to help those students um, get to the point and be on grade level. So make sure we do that. And John O'Connor from uh, the book, Great Instruction, Great Achievement, I think we've talked about this a couple times, but I'll show it again. He talks about having a series of preloaded interventions and have those interventions ready for students at all levels. That way you're not always having to reinvent the wheel. You have a set of those interventions and you know if Johnny has reading comprehension issues and perhaps he's in fourth grade, um, but yet he's reading on a first grade level in terms of comprehension, we can go to those preloaded interventions, find what we can use for him and begin that instruction. And I, again, to talk about Anita Archer, I love it where she talks about uh, 
low prep but high impact. And I think that's a set of interventions that you can have preloaded and ready to go. Um, and I think that would become a low prep issue, but yet a high impact. And so uh, John O'Connor talks about having those common interventions for common problems that we can utilize initially. And of course, if those common interventions that we have prepared don't work, then of course, we could come up with something more individualized for that student. But um, I think the whole gist is to have something ready that we can pull and not waste valuable planning time and instructional time um, trying to search for those things. So one thing I would encourage with that is to have um, those materials ready to go and not only have them ready to go, but as a teacher, understand how to provide those interventions for the student. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, and Paul, you want to talk to us just a little bit about that? Uh, what Cheryl just alluded to was the ready to go menu. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, all students are afforded, including students with disabilities, the right to have solid core instruction at every level. Uh, so, you know, as we think about that, um, yeah, I think John O'Connor really uh, talked about filling in the gap uh, that a lot of these same interventions that we're uh, working on with our uh, students with disabilities would apply to those students that are in the gap. So I think um, there's some real benefit if we can really hone in on what the co-teaching model should look like and get our uh, students in groups that there's, there would be some incidental benefit from all this great differentiation and great teaching that we're doing as special educators that, that there would be a great benefit for a lot of folks and we would be filling in some of those gaps that exist. Some of those gaps that exist are certainly around reading, math, and writing, those basic skills, and then those more complex skills of, of, of actually writing something, writing a, uh, a well-written paragraph or paper, or being able to comprehend what you're reading as you move through the grade levels. So certainly when John O'Connor talks about that, uh, he's talking about more than just special uh, students. He's talking also about those kids that may not qualify, but may benefit from your great instruction anyway. And and then he goes on to talk about establishing those front load interventions to meet those common skill gaps. So he's what he's what he's alluding to here is I think that you know you're sitting there in July and you're getting ready to start and you realize I've got a caseload with a couple of kids that are SLD, a couple of kids that are MMD and I have a couple of kids that are OHI, uh, and I have several things that, I've, uh, that I know are coming already. I know I'm gonna have to deal with reading fluency. I know I'm gonna have to deal with comprehension issues, basic reading skills, the ability or, uh, to remember simple computation facts, um, the ability to construct a sentence from three words. So we, you know, those are just some examples of things that you, you can um, really, focus your attention on and look at the research and what the research says around those and have those in your toolbox ready to go so that when you do run into a student that may have uh, um, a low incidence disability or maybe some type of special situation that you would have time to then uh, devote your time to that and that we could move to that quickly and we would have that toolbox ready to go for those things that we know are coming every year on a caseload, no matter what the student's name is, we know we're gonna to have to work on reading, we know we're gonna to have to work on math, and we know we're gonna to have to work on writing, and we also know, Douglas, that we're gonna to have to include behavior sometimes when those students are acting. Uh, but the, the whole idea of getting response and getting uh, more practice turns, more feedback, more engagement, is to engage the students to a degree that you're gonna develop a relationship and it's gonna keep down some of those things that we see that uh, are disrupting our classes. And hopefully we're gonna develop better relationships with kids and have a greater, uh, more permanent learning environment for our students. Uh, so that's about all I had to say about that. All right, thank you, Danny. Uh, so the next one is just talking a little bit about that metacognitive instruction. And so it's important that we teach kids to think about that process of their own thinking. That's where the model for explicit instruction uh, is very, when that you teach a lesson, you model that, you do the think aloud, you talk through that problem solving, and you have that 
you let the kids listen to what you're saying as your problem solving so that they can model that same strategy because a lot of times our kids don't know how to uh how they how what's their best learning style how to work through a, situ a problem or a reading passage so it's just important that we give them we model that and then we give them an opportunity to reflect on their learning um, and uh, you know we create a plan we give kids an opportunity to really structure that learning and, and how they progress through uh the standard and i'm gonna let them talk a little bit about students that some of the issues they have with uh, metacognition Thank you, Ms. Dion. Uh, some of the issues that you may see are uh, the kids with students with uh, disabilities that we work with, they have difficult times in social situations. So a lot of times we as educators need to go back and teach social skills in small groups and have complete small group activities with these kids so that when they get into these social settings, they'll have appropriate ways to build uh, how to talk to individuals, how to introduce themselves, carry on conversations, so forth and so on. Another thing that we see a lot of problems with, I myself have trouble with, is organization. Keeping my locker organized, keeping my desk organized. Anyone else have that problem? Yeah. Don't clean it. I'll never find anything on it. But we can teach these kids strategies or provide them with strategies uh, to be able to keep their uh, work mode organized and uh, ways to uh, use uh, uh, what, are, what are some uh, ideas, some strategies, graphic organizers when checklist. they're doing works, checklists, checklist. uh, so forth, so on, so just some of the, the quick things. Uh, one thing that I would like to mention that, you know, a lot of our kids with disabilities have difficult times, like I said, with social situations and not knowing what the expectations are in the school setting and, you know, because the way you behave in hallways differently than what you do in the gym and what you do in the cafeteria. So when we develop those expectations for our school-wide uh, PBIS programs, we need to make sure that we teach those expectations in those specific environments in the school. This is what it means when you're riding the bus. These are the expectations we have for you. These are the things that we're gonna teach you how to ride the bus. And we're gonna give them the examples. We're gonna provide them with uh, guided practice. We're gonna model those activities. Then we're gonna reteach those activities as often as possible. Uh, so another thing are just goal setting activities or goal setting strategies we can use with the, our students, uh, teachers, uh, ask the kids what they want to do and, you know, and come up with some ideas and some suggestions of if they've got a goal to go to college, then what are some activities or what are some things that we're going to have to do to be able to achieve that goal, you know, as far as making sure you're keeping your grades up, your attendance, social skills, so forth and so on like that. So. Consistency is the key. Be consistent. Good. All right. And so um, we're now we're just thinking about, you know, our specially designed instruction needs to include that expli explicit instruction and thinking about that metacognition, just like Doug was talking about, you know, a checklist or if you're reading a reading comprehension uh, passage and you're trying to think through, you know, uh, you're modeling how to infer or you're, so we have to teach kids that. And then we have to think about, we do that through that explicit instruction with behavior, academics, whatever, but we always just keep that a focus that we help them plan. We help them give them opportunity for guidance uh, and give them some feedback and um, just really giving them some opportunity to reflect on what they've learned. So I think that's real important. Sometimes we just move on to something else and we don't give kids time to think about what they've learned. Did, did they get it right? Did they miss a step? Did they overlook something? And so when we think about our, our explicit instruction and how we do that specially designed instruction, I think we can really do that. And, and that gives us a way to monitor the progress, right? So we can, we can check to see how well they're doing, you know, on their checklist or on their organizer or that kind of thing. So, you know, Dion, you bring, bring up a very good point there. If we're, if we're providing all of these opportunities for response, then we're providing the teacher also then is providing themselves with a ton of opportunities to gather and collect data all the time. So uh, progress monitoring then becomes a daily thing and not so much uh, an event uh, where you plan a day, I'm gonna take data today. Well, you can take data all week and record it once if you've got your goal set at weekly. But you should be able to get tons of data if you are having these types of activities for students uh, in your classes. 
uh, then there should be ample opportunity to collect data. Absolutely. So, uh, if anybody have any other questions, comments, or anything at this point? So we are glad that you joined us. Uh, I'm just checking the date for our um, our next Zoom meeting, and that's going to be in January of 2020, and that will be at um, 3:30 on January the 8th, and that's going to be a focus on behavior. So we're kind of just doing the roundtable discussion again, and we're going to just talk about behavior and supports for behavior. So thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you back on uh, January the 8th. Thank you.